Okay, now that we've worked through um, our sort of life cycle evolution and uh, specifically looking at the elaboration of the sporophyte generation and the um, and the reduction of the gametophyte generation as we move through uh, land plant lineages, I want to zoom in now and look at a few of those, show you some pictures and give you some a bit more information about these bryophyte lineages and what they look like. And so just as a reminder, we'll start out with, we'll start out looking at, uh, there we go. We'll start out um, looking through some of these characteristics again, but um, looking at our liverworts and then hornworts and mosses and look um, at, at some of these innovations that I've, that I've marked on here again. Uh, so as a, as a quick reminder, bryophytes are made up of, bryophytes are uh, paraphyletic, made up of these three lineages, liverworts, Hornworts and mosses. And these are paraphyletic. Put this slide on here to remind me to tell you that these grow in wet environments. We find all of our bryophyte, or most of our bryophyte lineages are focused um, in wet environments. And that's a restriction often that has to do with their gametophyte dominant life cycle and the need for sperm to actually swim through a film of water into uh, the archegonium to fertilize the egg. Also, just a reminder, these lack vascular tissue. Um, and so we don't have any specialized water conducting tissue. This keeps them, this also is tied to those wet environments um, and they are gametophyte dominant. Let's take a look at some of these just so you see um, see what a few of these lineages actually look like. And so here we've got um, mosses. Here we've got a moss with its gametophyte, the green part and the, the capsule and stalk, the stalk and the capsule are our sporophyte, um, hornworts, and then two different, uh, two different liverwort uh, groups, the leafy liverworts and the thallos liverworts. Um, within, uh, and so just to look specifically at the liverworts to start with, thallos liverworts the, are those where those, the body of the liverwort is sort of flattened out and uh, um, this flattened structure uh, and uh, photosynthesis occurs there and then there's another group of liverworts that are called leafy liverworts and those leafy liverworts the gametophyte is actually has more of like a stem and leaf kind of arrangement to it rather than just that flat body um, we get that that stem and leaf arrangement um, as a just to remind you there are no stomata so none of none of these have stomata a lot of times those leafy liverworts are actually um, uh, mistaken for mosses because they look quite moss-like in their form. Overall, there's about 9,000 species of liverworts um, and they're split about one-third, two-thirds. The leafy liverworts are around two-thirds of that diversity. Oh, I've got that on the slide here for you. So two thirds of the diversity are found in those leafy liverworts. We have no stomata. And so instead we've got these simple pores uh, associated with those uh, for gas exchange through the cuticle. We've gone through the structure of those pores already.
when we look at the liverwort sporophytes, the sporophytes are actually embedded within the tissue, um, embedded within that gametophyte tissue. And so on liverworts, when they become reproductive and create antheridia and archegonia, those are created on these uh, specialized structures called antheridia pores and archegonia pores. It's not important, but it's this umbrella-like structure that we see um, associated with this thallus liverwort right here. And in the bottom of that, uh, from the underside of that, we actually have where the archegonia are formed. Uh, those archegonia um, is where the sperm would swim up that stalk and into the archegonia, fertilize that egg, and that young sporophyte would uh, form as sometimes just a simple ball of tissue in there, but oftentimes have a slight stalk and a capsule uh, like arrangement like we like we see in a moss and so the sporangium is the capsule that the oops, the sporangium is the capsule that we have there and the sorry a little technical difficulty there we go the sporangium is the capsule that we have there and the um, inside of that are all the spores and then the stalk is uh, would, would be below that. All right, hornworts are much less diverse. Hornworts only around a hundred species of hornworts. Um, so not very, not very diverse at all. And one of the cool things about horn, you see that hornworts are thallos. They look a lot like liverworts too, um, where they have just that sort of flattened out body plan. Um, but one of the cool things about those is that the sporophyte, which is this stalk here, has this elongated capsule, and the sporophyte is actually photosynthetic. And so photosynthesis actually occurs in both the gametophyte and the sporophyte part of the generation. In this picture down below, we can actually see some of those sporophyte capsules actually opening up along their whole length, turning brown and releasing those, uh, releasing those spores. The other thing that's cool about hornwort sporophytes is that they have stomata. And these stomata actually are really similar in their structure to what we see in, um, in other vascular plants where these have these two guard cells in that pore and they can regulate the opening and closing of those as we talked about before. So hornworts actually do have stomata. Mosses are the most diverse of the bryophyte lineages. Mosses are around 15,000 species of mosses. These are quite a, quite a few. Um, they also have stomata. Mosses also have stomata to allow for gas exchange. Um, and they have a, a lot of diversity. Some of these might have, uh, some mosses also have water conducting cells. And these are, I mentioned these before, um, they're not full vascular tissue. We call these hydroids. And they're seen in the fo fossil record and they're kind of prevascular tissue. So uh, plant tubes is the other word that you'll see um, associated with these. And so they're not really vascular tissue, as we'll see vascular tissue has some very specific structures. This and morphologies, these actually don't have those. Um, when we see them, when we look at a moss sporophyte, so remember the green is all the gametophyte tissue. When we look at a moss sporophyte, moss sporophytes um, are typically made up of this uh, sort of stalk and capsule arrangement. 
And the capsule itself has a, a specialized dispersal function, uh, uh, morphology in this operculum. So the operculum is um, as a cap that opens up and actually allows for more efficient spore dispersal. That's a little added adaptation that we see in mosses. Okay, so those are our three bryophyte lineages. Um, and some of the, just to show you a few pictures and see a little bit of that morphology there, I encourage you guys to go outside and look for some of these, keeping in mind um, that liverworts and hornworts are gonna be a little harder to find than, than mosses. Um, and we had, I showed you that Cooksonia fossil in one of our previous lectures. And so here's sort of a, a reconstruction of that. And I just wanted to remind you that our first, um, those first polysporangiophytes, so things that actually had, uh, had um, sporophytes that branched, these branch sporophytes, lacked a vascular system. So they're still non-vascular plants, similar to what we see, you know, similar, more similar to bryophytes. Um, but they get, they have these branch sporophytes and over time, these became larger, more co complex and acquired a vascular system. And so that's something, this is leading us away from the non-vascular plant lineages into our vascular plant lineages. And so I want to talk now about our main vascular plant lineages and uh and what uh you know and what these are composed of and the adaptations and morphological structures and synapomorphies that we see throughout the evolution of vascular plants so i've seen we've seen this slide before but i'll just i'll come back to it our vascular plants um, are made up of both seedless vascular plants so ones that reproduce by spores um, so these reproduce via spores. Um, and those include two separate lineages. The lycophytes is one of those lineages. And then the ferns. And ferns are, uh, include what we call whisk ferns and horsetails. These are things that don't tr look like our traditional ferns. And so we're, in previous classifications, we're actually separated out from ferns. It turns out, uh, especially from molecular phylogenetic evidence, that whisk ferns and horsetails are just highly modified ferns. And so all of these represent the fern lineage themselves. And so on my slides, when I show lycophytes and ferns, um, these are our two lineage in our phylogenies, these are our two lineages, two separate lineages of uh, two separate lineages of seedless vascular plants. They don't make seeds during reproduction, but they have vascular tissue. Our seed plants, so ones that reproduce via seeds, um, do, that have vascular tissue are also made up of two lineages. One of them is broken out into five, four different groups, cycads, ginkgos, conifers and neophytes, and these are our gymnosperms. And then our second seed plant lineage is the angiosperms or the flowering plants. Gymnosperms includes um, conifers, which we're most familiar with, and they're actually the most diverse of the, um, of the gymnosperm uh, lineages. Okay, so here's our vascular phylogeny sort of expanded out for you. Um, I've got our carapicean green algae here, uh, liverworts, hornworts, and mosses. And then I've now shown you our vascular plants here. And on this phylogeny, I have noted some of the synapomorphies. I'm gonna walk us through each of these synapomorphies, starting with one of the big ones that we've already mentioned is the dominant sporophyte. So sporophyte dominant, life cycle 
is one of these big ones. Um, the, uh, and, as we, and so sporophyte dominance is shared by lycophytes, all of our ferns, which includes those whisk ferns and horsetails, so our fern lineage, and then our seed plant lineage as well. So remember bryophytes, those hornworts, liverworts, and mosses, those are gametophyte dominant, sporophyte dependent. You just walk through this life cycle, the dominant, what you see when you go outside and look at this mat of, of green stuff, that's the gametophyte. The sporophytes are just those capsules. So we've got these gametophyte dominant, sporophyte dependent life cycle. When we look at, uh, when we look at our vascular plant lineages, I use this, uh, I use this fern um, lineage. I should change this here to vascular plants. Um, and we, what we see in this one is, is a sporophyte dominant and a reduced gametophyte. And I mentioned before that how reduced the gametophyte is varies in some of these different vascular plant lineages. But the main point is that we have uh, a switch to sporophyte dominance where the thing that we see when we go outside is and what we notice is actually the sporophyte the diploid part of the generation not the gametophyte the gametophyte is much reduced um, in the case of ferns just a tiny little thing and so when we look at this fern here on the right side of this slide is a tree fern this is a tree fern um, these, so there are some arborescent ferns. Um, these grow in mostly tropical environments and subtropical environments. Um, this tree fern, although the sporophyte is quite large, this might be 20 feet tall, the gametophyte is this tiny little, uh, this tiny little, um, the gametophyte is this tiny little free-living, separate, independent, um, independent organism that's very much reduced. And so that's the point here. We have sporophyte dominance and this reduced gametophyte. Um, this one's showing the sporophyte growing out of that gametophyte, so that new developing sporophyte. Okay, so we've worked our way through that synapomorphy of sporophyte dominance. I wanna now move into the next one, which is um, the the next one, which is vascular tissue. So actually having a vascular tissue comprised of xylem and phloem. So I don't think this is the first time you've heard xylem and phloem, but I wanna make sure that, that we know what we're talking about. So the vascular system is used to move fluids throughout the plant. And it's made up of two different types of tissues, xylem and phloem. Xylem is for moving water. And phloem is for moving sugars. Uh, sugars, or what we often call photosynthate. Throughout the plants. Um, if we... Uh, so what I'm showing here are some uh, cross sections, microscope cross sections of stems and, and roots um, that, that are taking a, if this is a plant stem, taking a cross section across that, a very thin section across a plant stem um, or a root, and then staining that with various different stains and that stain different tissues, different colors. Um, and, uh, and then looking at that under a, a light microscope. And this would be one cross section of a, of a stem. So this is a stem cross section. And what we see here are individual vascular bundles. And what I mean by vascular bundle, you can think of this as like a vein. This is a vein running through um, the plant stem. And these veins run all the way through the roots and into the stems and then out into the leaves. And you're used to looking at a leaf and seeing all the veins through the leaves, although they're all connected um, back down through, in, through the plant down to the roots. So these are those vascular bundles. Um, you can think of these similar to a vein. 
these are veins running through the plant. And we notice that we've got actually different color staining in the vascular bundle, whether you're toward the center of the stem or toward the outside of the stem. And that corresponds to our xylem and our phloem. And so if we zoom in onto one vascular bundle here, in this other side of the slide, on the left side of the slide, we actually see, can see the xylem toward the inside of the stem and the phloem toward the outside of the stem. And these are staining differently. Um, so xylem will stain darker because it has thick cell walls. So it stains dark and it's toward the inside of the stem. Phloem, on the other hand, doesn't stain um, as darkly at all, and so and is toward the outside of the uh, the stem. So it doesn't stain, and it's toward the outside of the stem. And so each vascular bundle that we see in this in this, you can see toward the inside of the stem, there's our xylem, and the outside of the stem, there's our phloem. Now, I'm not going into too much detail about these now, except to introduce the idea of vascular tissue, vascular system that, that's comprised of xylem and phloem. I'll go through a few different, uh, a few different things about the structure of these uh, in, in the plant um, and some of their function. But in the next chapter, we'll actually go into a lot more detail about xylem and phloem. And so um, I'll save some of those details in terms of tissue types. Um, then, but right now that's what we're looking at. These vascular bundles do run down into the root. In the root, the form, they're a little bit different um, in terms of how they're, um, how the xylem and phloem are arranged, but this is actually a root cross section down here. So here's our root cross section, and we've got xylem actually toward in the center of this. So all these big cells with their dark red staining around the outside, these are all the xylem. And then in between the xylem are the phloem. And we'll look at the structure, as I said, in the next chapter of all of these, um, uh, these, types of, these tissue types and how they're arranged in different plant groups. But um, just to show you, that's a, a root cross section with the xylem and phloem uh, as well. All right, so if we take a look a little bit uh, more closely at xylem, um, Xylem itself are composed of tracheids, is what the names of these uh, are primarily of tracheids. Tracheids, what these are is elongate, hollow cells, that, so like straws, right? They're like straws, these elongate hollow cells that are dead at maturity. So these are actually not living cells when they're mature and functioning. So dead at maturity. Um, and these, like I said, these move water. Move water through the plant. And so the figures that we're seeing on the, si on the right side here actually show um, two different sections of that. Of, of xylem in a, in a woody plant. And so this one on the bottom is actually a cross section, and this one on the top is a longitudinal section. So a cross section, I already explained. Cross sections, if we were to take that straw and cut it off the top and then look down the bottom, look, look down at it, right? And I see, what I see is the cross section of that, um, of that, particular, of that particular cell, that elongate cell. When I do a longitudinal section, I'm actually slicing it this way and looking at the side view of it, looking side on. And what I, what I see there is this is one of those elongate cells that's dead at maturity and hollow. And I'm looking down the side view of that. Um, what you're seeing uh, what these little circles are here are actually pits. And so while water can move, moves up and down through the cell, water through the, the tracheids, through these xylem cells, water can also move side to side through these. And they move side to side through 
these pits. So these are holes in the cell walls um, that are associated, uh, that allow it to move between tracheids that are lining up next to each other. And so if I were to just draw this out really quick so you sort of can see what I'm talking about, um, if I have a couple of xylem tracheids stacked side to side, these pits are actually holes that are connecting these to each other, top and bottom, and side to side. So the tracheids are connected by what we call pits. We can look at it in a little bit of detail about how those pits work. And so um, one of the reasons that tracheids actually, the xylem stains really dark like that in, a, in, in these sections where they have that dark red stain associated with them is that tracheids have secondary cell walls. So they have two cell walls, a primary cell wall and a secondary cell wall. And these are lignified. And so lignin is a special polymer um, that actually seals these cells up and makes them really strong. And so we have these secondary cell walls that have lignin in them. Those secondary cell walls, water can't move through. They can't move through the secondary cell walls, but water freely moves through the primary cell wall. And so what those, when you're looking at those pits that we saw associated with all of the, the cell, uh, these tracheid cells here, what we're seeing, the reason they look sort of like a, uh, like a bullseye with that, those, that one ring on the outside and the ring on the inside is that what you're seeing is actually a perforation in the secondary cell wall, but the primary cell wall is still intact in them. And so when, and so we, when you look down at it, it kind of looks like a donut. But the primary cell wall is still intact. Their secondary cell wall has a hole in it. Water freely moves through those. And so when water is moving through a tracheid element, it can move up and down, but it can also move side to side into the different ones. And that becomes important as sort of redundancy. If any of these gets broken or clogged up, um, maybe clogged up with a fungus, this happens quite a bit then the water can move into a different one um, as it moves up a, up a tree or up a plant. Let's look at our next type of, uh, the second type of tissue that we see in the vascular system of plants, and this is the phloem. Phloem, remember, moves sugars. So the products of photosynthesis. Um, and phloem is comprised of what we call um, sieve elements, sieve tubes. One of the things, there's a couple things I want to note about these. So phloem are elongated cells that are living at maturity. And so because they're alive, they actually have cell membranes surrounding them. And if you remember, water can move through cell membranes, but large molecules can't move freely through cell membranes. And so to be able to move um, sugars through these sieve elements, they actually have to do that actively. So these actively move sugars throughout the plant. And what, is it, what do I mean by active? Well, active has a specific definition, and that definition is that it requires ATP. It uses energy in the cell to be able to put the sugars into the sieve tubes and take the sugars out of the sieve tubes. Just like before, um, uh, ju just like I said with the xylem in the next chapter when we talk about this, and especially when we talk about water and sugar movement in plants and how that actually is transported, we'll go into detail um, about how these are actively loading and unloading sugars. Um, just to, for clarity here, I'll put on, oops, this is a longitudinal section uh, that's on the right side of the slide here. So like, just like before, cutting these lengthwise and looking at the sides. So live cells 
that are actively moving sugar throughout the plant. 